2014 seems a very long time ago, but that's when Microsoft first unveiled DirectX 12 to the world. It was created to answer the calls from developers to tackle issues that were plaguing PCs at the time and allow them to fully access the hardware and utilize it. Both DirectX 12 and Vulkan owe a lot to AMD's Mantle technology. And in fact, you can say that Mantle actually formed the basis, the core of Vulkan, which we've tackled extensively in the past. AMD's Mantle was proprietary and only worked on AMD's own hardware, but did show what a low-level API was capable of, and kick-started the low-level API revolution for PCs. We here at River Gaming Tech did extensively cover Mantle, Vulkan, and DirectX 12 when they were initially announced, and in fact we did have a few exclusive interviews with AMD's Robert Halleck concerning Mantle, along with Neil Trevitt from the Kronos Group, you can find those linked in the video description. It was very easy to see demos like the Witch demo and draw all of the prospect of what was to come. As I'm writing this, NVIDIA, AMD, Microsoft and others in the industry are waxing lyrically about ray tracing. Now that Microsoft have shown off DXR, DirectX Ray Tracing, we can only salivate of what the future might hold for computer graphics. Therefore, it would be easy to assume that the majority of PC titles now would either be using Vulkan or DirectX 12. And we would see DX11 or uh, OpenGL relegated to just indie titles or games that didn't push the visual envelope. This just hasn't been the case, and games like Resident Evil 7, Final Fantasy 15, and even Call of Duty Black Ops 4 are all firmly stuck on DirectX 11. The reasons for slower adaptation are numerous. It's harder to develop games using DirectX 12 or Vulkan, particularly if you're really pushing the optimization boat out on them. And older hardware typically performs better with DirectX 11, although things are starting to change here, as people are either upgrading their machines naturally or are forced to do so because of newer titles. Combine this with newer drivers and SDKs that were immature at the time, and this is yet another area that's evolving, and... DX12 and Vulkan are becoming more numerous in their support. Microsoft's adoption of DirectX 12 to both the Xbox platform and PC and the dizzy array of platforms you can target with Vulkan have seen the release of games using these apps speed up. Now, id Software's Doom and Doom Eternal, Wolfenstein games and Microsoft's own titles and Square Enix titles are particularly easy to point to when it comes to pushing these new apps. But, and this is the elephant in the room, what actual performance difference is there between DirectX 11 versus DirectX 12 or OpenGL versus Vulkan? Well, we're here to answer that very question. And we're going to do so with a wide variety of testing to, to boot. We'll be using an Intel i7-8700 processor, but with different core count configurations, disabling threads to see how the appy scales. For graphics, we'll be using NVIDIA's GeForce GTX 1080 Ti and test across the three most common resolutions, 1080p, 1440p, and of course, 4K. Oh, and we'll also be using a combination of manual runs along with built-in benchmarks as well. We'll also combine this with Crucial Ballistics RAM and an MSI B360 Gaming Pro Carbon motherboard. And of course, Windows 10 combined with the latest software patches to the latest retail versions. Before we continue, we'd also like to thank MSI for providing the motherboard and processor used in this uh, analysis. And if you'd like to check out the motherboard review, you can find it linked in the video description. Finally, we'd like to thank you all for watching and sharing the video, subscribing, and of course, donating to us on Patreon. And you guessed it, that's also linked in the video description as well. Plug, plug. If you'd like more results on games across different resolutions, lower core counts, and testing with a GTX 1080 along with the 1080 Ti, along with more DirectX 11 titles, including Final Fantasy 15, you can check out our CPU and resolution scaling video, which, you guessed it, is linked below. If you regularly watch the channel, you'll be aware that one of our favourite benchmarks is Rise of the Tomb Raider, and this set of testing is no different. We run the game using both the built-in benchmark and manual runs through the game's geothermal valley level. Start things out with the built-in benchmark, and this shows a rolling demo of several of the game's locales. We can immediately see that yes, there is a slight nod towards DirectX 12, but the slight is the operative word. DirectX 12 has a 10 FPS lead with the 8700 running with all of its cores and threads. Disabling hyperthreading does show a slight improvement to both DirectX 12 and 11 results, but the X12 continues its lead. 
The only anomaly here was four cores and four threads, which performed better than all of the other tests combined. We ran this test several times and came across with the same result each time. Naturally, higher resolutions tend to shift more of the responsibility to the GPU, and even at just 1440p, you'll find yourself GPU bound. By the time 4K rolls around, there's very little in DX11 versus DX12 results, and just margin of error creeps in, really. Don't forget, we actually have taken Rise of the Tomb Raider to just a few threads in our CPU scaling video, and the results were quite similar. Well, that's all there is to it then, right? DirectX 11 is a little slower than DirectX 12? Well, not quite. Let's try some manual runs of Rise of the Tomb Raider. Once again, we're going to be using the Geothermal Valley. This is a great area in the game because a lot of stuff is happening. It's easily repeatable to do manual runs without much variance, and it also pushes the CPU and GPU, and thus makes for a fantastic worst case scenario for the game engine. We're asking it to push a lot of water, physics, lots of draw calls, large number of NPCs, and vast waves of land. Thus, constantly swapping data in and out of both the GPU and main system memory as well. 1080p immediately shows the difference. Focusing on the 12 thread DirectX 12 versus DirectX 11 for just a second, we can see a huge gap in the average frame rate of about 40%. But truly, the real test comes from the minimal frame rate, which is almost double in difference. Think of this. DirectX 12 with four cores and four threads is very similar in performance aside the max FPS to the 12 thread DirectX 11 tests. Intriguing. All right, all right, compelling data, but we're giving the GPU a lot of leeway. Let's increase the pixel counts by 2.25 times, also known as 1440p. What happens now? Well, the average FPS isn't really the story. There's only eight FPS separating the best performance, which is DX12 with 12 threads, and the worst performance, which is DX11, four threads. But the minimum, the 1% and even the 0.1% have startling differences. Once again, 4 cores and DirectX 12, 8 pace, 12 thread DX11. At the worst case scenario with just 4 physical cores, average FPS is only slightly better on DX12. But the 0.1, the 1% and minimum and max are all better. Basically speaking, you'll get a smoother and more consistent experience with the game running in DirectX 12 mode. Even if you present the game with just 4 physical cores to throw at the problem. Hitman 2016 is yet another title which has embraced DirectX 12, and the results here are almost as clear as Rise of the Tomb Raider. There's a 20% difference between DirectX 12 and DirectX 11 with all 12 threads, although DX11 does do slightly better without hyper-threading and our 6 physical core test, in other words hyper-threading disabled. Although going further down the CPU core and stack and yeah, DX12 just continues to beat the competition, finishing 6% faster with just 4 cores. Although it's clear that with just four cores, the tests really start to become CPU bound. At 1440p, the situation is similar, with DirectX 12 coming on top, but at 4K, where we're pushing the GPU to its limits, and we run into a consistent situation where DirectX 12 loses to DX11. We'll investigate this further in part two of our analysis where we'll bring more games and graphics cards into the mix, and of course, it goes without saying that if you want to see this stuff, please support this channel by, well, subscribing. DirectX 12 is a bit of a strange one, because we're clearly at the cusp of the game being GPU bound, even with only high settings in 1080p. Our reference design GTX 1080 tie just hits the wall. The results are really close, and there's not much more to say other than DirectX 11 is ever so slightly faster, other than with hyper-threading off with just six cores. While the resolution increasing though, the situation changes totally, and DirectX 12 takes slightly the lead, and at 4K we get the results which are pretty much identical. There are slightly better minimums and high FPS in play here, but the results aren't really a big deal. Particularly at high resolutions and graphical settings, you will not be able to lock to 60 FPS at 4K here, particularly if you decide to max the rest of the options. As of the singularity, Escalation requires a little introduction, and Brad Wardell and his team at Stardock were a staunch proponent of DirectX 12 and low-level APIs from the get-go. There's little I can say about the results other than DirectX 12 continues to dominate the performance across all of the testing. Quite simply put, Ash of the Singularity does better with additional threads and an ability to use those threads. 
The game engine is designed to show massive battles and with large number of units and calculating all the AI, the weapon fire trajectories, keeping track of all that's going on, and of course actually drawing this and displaying on screen really just does a number on the CPU. And yet another popular benchmark for DirectX 12 is Civilization 6. And we use the AI benchmark with DirectX 12 versus DirectX 11. Rather than frame rate, this measures the time it takes for AI to run a series of turns. And yep, DirectX 12 does slightly edge out here. Finally, we'll go to Doom, which was used as a public demo back in the day to show off Vulkan versus OpenGL and running on an NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1080. We decide to run through the game as there's no built-in benchmark and look at the averages and performance. We decide to stick to 1080p because it's a great example where the legacy OpenGL is clearly at a major disadvantage compared to Kronos Group's latest and greatest API. As a quick aside, in the future we'll be testing more Vulcan games including Doom Eternal and Wolfenstein 2, so if that's something you're interested in, do of course subscribe for that content. We decided to take the Intel i7-8700 running at its full might of 6 cores, 12 threads, and then reducing it to just 4 physical cores and seeing how it did. The maximum frame rate isn't the issue, it's not the story. Clearly the game engine is the limiting factor. Doom 2016 is limited to just 200 FPS after all. But the averages and the low frame rates, those are super interesting. OpenGL does terribly with 12 threads available and this can be immediately seen with low FPS of just 139 for the average. That's considerably worse than the 4 cores in OpenGL and 4 cores with Vulkan, but, but, Vulkan meanwhile is a completely different story. For a start, Vulkan on either 4 cores or 12 threads essentially locks to 200 FPS with textual area loads here or there, and if there's a lot of stuff happening on screen, for a moment or two, the G GTX 1080 tie might become the problem. The low FPS is also startling, with the 1% low FPS jumping almost 40%, and the minimum frame rates doubling from 12 threads to OpenGL to 12 threads with Vulkan, and we see a 66 FPS increase over the minimum from OpenGL to Vulkan. There's not much I can really say other than what these numbers show. Vulkan just decimates OpenGL. And the performance increase isn't just tangible, it's completely in a different world. So there you have it then, legacy APIs versus the latest and greatest. Part 1 of this project has been very much a labour of love, and Part 2 will return with a look at different resolutions, we will look at further uh, Vulkan games, and testing with mid-range hardware, and of course the latest and greatest as well. So with that said, if you're currently a subscriber, you can stick around, and if you're not, well, consider becoming one. Because, well, you help make this content. A quick plug, we're also on Patreon, you can check us out, uh, link is in the video description. Do know that even just a single dollar a month is greatly appreciated and does directly impact what we can put out on the channel. Of course, if you can't afford to donate or just don't want to, simply liking the content, sharing and commenting and interacting with us is super appreciated and we do honestly thank you from the bottom of our hearts for being part of uh, the community. With all that said, Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.